My name is Hans Ellington. I'm an assistant professor of wildlife ecology here at the Range Cattle REC. And uh, my lab group, the Rangeland Wildlife Ecology Lab, does research and extension on a wide variety of rangeland wildlife. Today, we're going to talk about wild pigs in Florida, and we're going to answer three questions. What are wild pigs? Why do we need to manage them? And how can we manage them? So wild pigs really is just an umbrella term for any pigs that occur outside of a fence on the landscape. So synonyms for wild pigs are wild hogs, feral hogs, wild boars, feral swine. And these animals, uh, the adults, um, range anywhere from 75 pounds to 250 pounds. They are sexually dimorphic. That means that the males and females are different, and the males are generally much bigger than the females. Now, wild pigs are an invasive species here in North America, and they're basically the wild version of our domestic swine. But they were originally native to Europe and Asia. Um, but as uh, Europeans moved uh, around the world, uh, they brought wild pigs with them. And so now pigs occur on every continent but Antarctica. And they were first introduced to the United States and to North America in the 1500s by the Spanish. So the Spanish brought them over and actually released them uh, so that they would continue to breed in the wild and then they could harvest them on return trips in the 1500s. Now, since then in the US, there's been many subsequent reintroductions and translocations of uh, pigs on the landscape. And in fact, uh, humans moving pigs around continues to enhance their populations in the United States and promote gene flow. Now, it's estimated that the US has over 5 million wild pigs, and that's probably an underestimate. And uh, the states with the largest populations are Texas and California, which are to be expected. These are really big states. Uh, but also Florida and Hawaii have really large wild pig populations. And Florida alone has over five or over 500,000 uh, wild pigs. And again, that's probably an underestimate. Now, one of the defining features of wild pigs and one of the reasons that they're so successful as an invasive species and so difficult to manage is they have a really high reproductive rate. So uh, one pregnant wild pig uh, could result in over 100 offspring in two years if all of her offspring all breed. And that's just assuming that, that, pig, that the pig breeds uh, once per year, produces one litter per year. But in Florida, the conditions are good enough in terms of resources that pigs can actually produce two litters per year. We're, and in Florida, we see peaks in breeding in the spring and the fall. So those numbers could even be double here in Florida. Uh, wild pigs are social animals. They exist on the landscape in social groups, and these groups are called sounders. And they're made up of adult females that are often related and their offspring of varying ages. Now, the adult males ex generally exist on the landscape as solitary individuals, and while a single adult male will often uh, overlap with the space used by multiple sounders. Now, wild pigs are diet and habitat generalists. That just means that they can eat about anything and live about anywhere. Um, now, there are some caveats to that. Uh, pigs are not very good at thermal regulation, so they don't sweat like uh, you and I do, and so they have more difficulty controlling their body heat. So in hot climates, like here in Florida, they need access to water. Um, and luckily in Florida, for the pigs, there's lots of water uh, around. Now, even though pigs will eat about anything, they do have some preferred food types that are seasonally available. So they really like hard mass, like acorns. So in the fall, they'll really focus in on acorns and other uh, hard mast uh, underneath uh, trees when those are available. In other times of the years, they will focus in on roots and tubers, especially in wet areas. Now, when we think about pigs on the landscape, you've got to uh, think that pigs exist uh, within a home range. So the space that they use on that landscape and their home range is dependent on uh, them meeting their energetic requirements. So finding enough food, ha having water sources and having places to shelter and rest. And so what we found in Florida by putting telemetry units on pigs 
is that the uh, the average home range size of a sounder, that's that social group of pigs, the, the adult females and their young, exist in about uh, a space of about 370 acres. And solitary males use more space generally, and that's because they're trying to overlap with multiple sounders uh, to enhance their breeding opportunities. Now, all of this uh, home range stuff is variable, right? So if the landscape uh, has fewer food resources, then uh, a wild pig's home range size is gonna be larger. Or if there's more individuals in that sounder, then that home range size will also need to be larger. And all of these things impact wild pig density on the landscape. So in landscapes that have a lot of food resources, you might have higher wild pig densities than on landscapes with fewer, fewer food, re food resources. So um, wild pigs are generally uh, don't experience much natural predation except when uh, they're piglets. So when wild pigs are less than six months old, they are susceptible to a lot of our predators here in Florida, including coyotes and bobcats, and even uh, large raptors and foxes. As adults, they are susceptible to a couple of predators, mainly in South Florida, the Florida panther and the python, and then large alligators can take some adult pigs as well. But the primary source of adult mortality in wild pigs is humans through accidents, hunting, and trapping. And so at this point, you might be thinking, well, are wild pigs present on my land? And if you've got a, 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 a chunk of land where you've got food for them and you're not actively doing a really robust wild pig control effort and you're not totally surrounded by development in Florida, the answer is probably yes. But you can look for some of the classic signs of wild pigs on your land. And uh, along with many other mammals, the e one of the easy ways to know if a wild pig has been present in an area is to look for its track, tracks and signs. So wild pig tracks look sort of like uh, deer tracks, except they're generally larger and more splayed out. Uh, their, uh, their droppings that are scat are more tubular, but they can vary in size and color depending on what that animal has been eating. But some of the more uh, easier to find clues uh, are related to wild pig behavior. So we talked earlier about how wild pigs can't really thermoregulate very well. And so they need access to water. And once they have that access to water, what they'll do on hot days to cool down is they'll get into, the, into that water, into that wet area, and they'll roll around in that mud, coat their body in mud to help cool it down. Well, this creates a wallow, a really thick, really uh, disturbed area that's also wet. And you can find these on a landscape if you've got wild pigs present. Often this is one of their resting locations. And they also, uh, you might see damage like this, and this is rooting damage. And so this is uh, related to pigs foraging for roots and tubers. And you can see uh, in these images that what the pigs have been doing is, is actually using their snout to sort of disturb the soil and find those roots and tubers. Often in these social groups of sounders, they can really uh, destroy a large patch of the landscape. And so these are the typical locations that you might associate with pig foraging activity. So given this, why should we manage wild pigs? And, and to be fair, I think we need to think about the impacts that wild pigs have on our land and uh, on the environment. And so first, I think it's fair to start with the positive impacts of wild pigs being present on the land. Uh, and probably the biggest uh, positive impact is hunting opportunities. So hunting wild pigs has been uh, a thing that is that Floridians have been doing for hundreds of years, right? There's a cultural heritage. It's an enjoyable activity that a lot of people uh, grew up doing and want to continue doing. Um, also, hunting wild pigs can generate income for your property, right? You can lease your land, uh, even if you're not hunting it, you can lease your land to other people that will pay for the opportunity to hunt wild pigs. But wild pigs also have many negative impacts on the landscape. Uh, they damage, they uh, have agricultural damage, they cause ecosystem damage, and they promote disease transmission. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about these negative impacts. So in the US alone, the USDA estimates that wild pigs cause $1.5 billion a year in damages and in control costs. 
Now, one of the primary routes for this damage is crop damage via direct consumption. Uh, and this is across the U.S. But uh, rooting damage here in Florida can also impact pastures and subsequently impact uh, livestock production. And so that video they are playing is uh, some wild pigs rooting the land right in front of the camera. And so uh, here's some of those images of rooting damage. So they're turning over the soil in search of food items when they're doing that. And when they're doing that in a big social group, it can cause a pretty big disturbance on the landscape. And there's been studies that have looked at uh, and have sought to quantify what that damage in rooting actually causes. So this was a study looking at different pastures where pigs were uh, present and pigs were absent. And so in the areas where pigs were present, where they were rooting, uh, we saw, or these uh, folks saw a average reduction in Bahia grass cover of over 40%. And in native grass pastures, they were seeing a reduction of over 60%. So uh, a really big reduction in the percent available forage for uh, livestock in these rooted areas. And that loss in forage can be translated into a direct loss in uh, value of that land in terms of calf production. So the same paper then quantified that into a dollar amount. So looking at an improved pasture that's been 20% rooted, we're looking at an average cost uh, of that rooting damage in terms of calf production of about $30 an acre. Now we also see a loss uh, in the semi-native, but semi-native pastures less productive for cattle or uh, for calves and cattle. And so the actual cost uh, is, is less. Um, however, wild pigs and their rooting damage can also have big impacts on native ecosystems. So when pigs root up the land and they turn that soil over, they're altering and modifying the soil chemistry and the underlying nutrients. They're destroying native vegetation and uh, altering the species com composition of that landscape. And one of the good examples of that is the positive feedback loop that we see between wild pigs and Carolina redroot. So Carolina redroot is a, a plant that sort of thrives in disturbed landscapes. And pigs, when they root up an area, uh, they're destroying a lot of that native vegetation. They're basically creating disturbance. And the Carolina redroot then outcompetes a lot of the other vegetation. It springs back faster. But pigs actually prefer Carolina redroot, so they're attracted to it. So an area that's been rooted might see an increase in Carolina redroot, which then causes uh, increased likelihood that that area will be rooted again by wild pigs, thus further increasing the coverage of Carolina redroot. And this can lead to large, almost monoculture patches of that plant. Now, uh, rooting uh, damage by wild pigs can also be a gateway for invasive plants using that same sort of mechanism. A lot of our invasive plants in Florida are also really good uh, early succession disturbance species and will outcompete native vegetation uh, once a uh, landscape has been uh, disturbed. Now, wild pigs' presence in a watershed can also impact water quality. And so this is from a study in Alabama where they looked at different watersheds where wild pigs were present and where no pigs were present. And what they found was that in watersheds where wild pigs were present, the organic nitrogen, carbon, sulfates, and calcium ions were anywhere from two to 11 times higher than when wild pigs were not present. Uh, and uh, E. coli concentrations were up to 40 times higher. And in uh, this figure, it's showing that the E. coli concentrations in all but one of the wild pig watersheds was above the recommended threshold. So we're definitely having an impact in terms of water quality from wild pigs. Now, wild pigs will also uh, compete with native wildlife. Uh, particularly for hard mast, for those acorns that they really prefer. Hard mast and acorns are the also preferred food sources for a lot of our favorite game species, white-tailed deer, turkey, and squirrels. But because wild pigs are big and social animals, they will out directly outcompete these other native wildlife for the most productive trees. They'll chase deer and turkey and squirrels away. And uh, wild pigs and deer 
uh, are what we call seed predators, right? So they consume the entire acorn. So when wild pig eats an acorn, uh, it's not going to sprout into an oak. But squirrels, conversely, uh, uh, promote uh, oak seedling establishment because they often bury acorns and then forget where they are and those uh, will sprout up. But if you have a really dense wild pig population uh, in an oak area, you could potentially be limiting seedless seedling establishment uh, for new oaks. Uh, wild pigs will also outcompete native wildlife at things like game feeders and can quickly destroy food plots through direct consumption and the rooting activity. Now, when wild pigs are rooting in the soil for those roots and tubers, they often opportunistically predate on a lot of our native wildlife. Now, invertebrates are the most commonly consumed animals by wild pigs, so things like earthworms um, and other things that are in the soil, but other sensitive species like uh, some of our amphibians can also be uh, consumed or their sensitive wetland habitats can be destroyed. Uh, and we've seen relationships between wild pig density and loss in these species. And then finally, wild pigs uh, are opportunistic predators on a lot of ground nesting young. Um, and so things like turkey and quail, if they find turkey and quail nests, they'll consume those eggs or those chicks. And that image there is a wild pig in South Carolina that found a sea turtle nest and then consumed those eggs as well. So it's a issue beyond our game birds. Now, wild pigs also promote disease transmission. So uh, swine brulosolosis, leptospirosis, these are diseases in pigs that have been practically eliminated or have been eliminated in our domestic populations for really robust vaccination programs. But in wild pigs, we can't vaccinate these animals. And so they remain, uh, these diseases remain in wild pigs uh, as a reservoir. Um, but these diseases can be really dangerous for humans and for livestock. And it's estimated that the wild pigs in Florida, uh, about 10% of the 10% of them are positive for swine brulosolosis. And this can also impact some of our native wildlife. And it's really common, there's many vectors on the landscape for wild pigs to potentially transmit disease to native wildlife. So think about a pig wallow, an area in, on the landscape where we've got water, it's wallowing around, it's potentially defecating uh, in, the, in that water. But then later, uh, our native wildlife use that water as well. So there's lots of vectors and ways that diseases can transmit between these animals. But it's not just native wildlife that can be impacted. So here's a water trowel that uh, a sounder of pigs are using, um, but this same water trowel could be later used by cattle. And so diseases, not only swine brucellosis, but also pseudo rabies can be transmitted to cattle. Uh, and it's fatal to cattle, to dogs, cats, and sheep. Pseudo rabies uh, is not, uh, not always fatal for swine. In fact, once they're weaned, the piglets often survive it, but they can continue to shed that virus for their entire life. And uh, at any given time, it's estimated that about 7% of wild pigs in Florida are actively shedding pseudo rabies. And the thing with pseudo rabies is it can exist in the landscape, in the environment for up to two weeks. So even if cattle aren't directly interacting with these pigs, if they come, uh, if one of these pigs is shedding pseudo rabies and then cattle come and drink from this water trail, they could potentially be exposed to that virus. And then another disease that we're really worried about in terms of wild pigs is African swine fever. So African swine fever doesn't currently, uh, isn't currently, uh, doesn't occur in the U.S. right now but it could be a really deadly disease. It's deadly for both our domestic swine and for our wild pigs. And the one of the primary sources for it spreading is uh, contaminated food sources. And so it's been detected in uh, parts of Europe and Asia in the past. It's been detected in the Caribbean. And one of the potential threats is that an infected food source from one of those countries will be disposed of in say a landfill in Florida and then wild pig consumes that infected food source, uh, becomes infected with African swine fever, and then it spreads through the wild pig population in, in the United States, eventually jumping into the domestic uh, herd, which would have huge economic impacts here in the US. So 
given all of these negative impacts, how do we manage wild pigs? And our current best tools for managing wild pigs are lethal removal. And uh, many uh, studies have sort of tried to estimate what do we need to do to slow population growth, to really fight that high reproductive rate in wild pigs. And, and they've often concluded that you need to remove up to 70% of the wild pigs on your landscape annually. And so you can't really do that using single individual techniques, things like hunting and single traps. You just simply can't do enough of that to actually remove 70%. And some of those techniques can actually be counterproductive because these animals are social. And if you're hunting uh, a wild pig and you shoot one animal in the sounder, well, the other individuals in that sounder that survive that, they learn from that experience. They're gonna be more difficult to hunt in the future. They're gonna be more wary of traps in the future. So because of that, really, if you want to have effective management, you need to aim to remove the entire sounder. And this has been quantified using modeling exercises. So this is from a paper from the USDA a couple of years ago. And so what they did is they modeled a wild pig population and then they introduced different control and management scenarios. So the first graph we're seeing here is random culling at about 20% of the population. That's something that we might actually achieve through hunting and single individual trapping. But you can see all those dashed lines those are the response of that wild pig population to that removal efforts given their high reproductive rate. And so you can see not a very big reduction in the population size. Now, if we introduce sounder-based or social group-based culling and still are just culling 20%, we do start to see an actual reduction in the population uh, size over time. But to really achieve uh, substantial reductions in the wild pig population and thus a reduction in damage. We need to really ramp up the amount of animals that are being removed and continue to employ that sounder based or social based, social group based culling. So how do we actually implement whole sounder trapping? And the first step for this is to identify the areas of high use. And so you want to identify the areas on your land uh, that pigs are foraging in. And this is probably, you've probably already identified this. You've already seen these damages, right? This is the reason that you're concerned about wild pigs. But this is the area that they're, the areas that they're rooting are some of their foraging areas. Now you need to start here and then you need to go spread out from this site and you need to look for areas with shade and water identifying their resting locations. And so once you've identified where animals are resting and when they're foraging, the best area to put your trap is on a travel route between those sites. Those are those high travel corridors that the animals are using. They're more likely to encounter your trap while they're moving between foraging and resting locations. Now it's also important that your trapping location uh, has vehicle access, right? Often traps that you use for whole sounder removal, you'll want to bring in on a vehicle instead of hauling in yourself. And you could be removing up to 20 to 30 animals in these traps. So you'll need also to have a way to remove those carcasses from the landscape. So vehicle access is important. You also wanna think about the appropriate timing when you're doing these actions. So if you're trying to attract uh, wild pigs to your trap, but there's a lot, it's in the fall and there's a lot of oak and uh, around, so you've got a lot of acorns on the landscape. Well, wild pigs are gonna be probably more interested in those acorns than they are in your bait piles. And so you're gonna, it's gonna take longer to attract the wild pigs to your trap, um, and the whole experience is going to take longer. Now, also, if pigs are currently being hunted, especially with dogs on that landscape, those pigs are gonna be extra wary and extra cautious, and it's gonna take longer for them to become accustomed to coming to your bait site regularly and into your trap. So again, if you are trapping in these sort of inopportune times, then it's going to take longer. Now, once you've identified your area and you've timed your trapping appropriately, you want to be pre-baiting. And you uh, pre-baiting, the goal here is to get the animals to come into your site every single night, come there every single night and eat that bait. You're getting them used to coming there. And so one of the most common wild pig baits is dry or fermented corn. Now, if you're struggling to attract pigs to your bait pile, you might wanna 
supplement that bait pile with vegetable scraps, molasses, gelatin powder, even commercial attractants. And you'll want to put a camera up on that pre-bait site. And the camera is doing two things, right? It's allowing you to monitor the bait pile so you can actually confirm it's wild pigs that are consuming that bait and not raccoons or something else. And then it allows you to count the number of pigs in that sounder. And that's important. You want to make sure later that you removed all the pigs in that group. And this is the first step to knowing how many pigs are in that group. Now, once you attracted pigs to your site, they're coming in regularly, then you want to think about putting down your trap. And you want to think about an effective trap design. Now, we've got an EDIS document, uh, a UF extension document, that's looking at all the different traps that you can use for wild pigs. But for whole sound or removal, there's several different options. Now, there has been studies that have looked at the effectiveness of different trap designs. And so traps that are activated by pigs using rooter sticks or bait pile sticks, those are a little less effective at removing the whole sounder than remotely activated traps. So traps that you're watching on your cell phone and waiting until the whole sounder is in to spring them, or traps that allow multiple individuals to enter after it has been sprung. So things like the funnel trap and those net traps. Those are generally more effective at removing the whole sounder than traps that are relying on the pig to trigger the trap. And that's what I said. Um, so once you've set up your trap, you want to leave it in the open position. You don't want it to be active because now your goal is switching to uh, baiting within the trap. You want pigs to then come into your trap every night. You want to get them used to coming into the trap. They're initially going to be wary of this new novel feature on the landscape. So you've got to put bait right in the center of the trap and probably do a bait trail leading from outside to inside the trap. And that's then again, bring those pigs in, continue to monitor it using your cameras, and you have to wait until your pigs are accustomed to the trap before you can make it active. And with your cameras, you'll be able to see that all the pigs are coming into the trap nightly. That's then the time that you can make that trap active. And then the final step is you need to have patience and persistence. This is going to take time, especially if your pigs have been educated by previous removal efforts. Um, you might, it might take a few weeks for them to come to your bait pile to get used to coming into the trap before you can make it active. Now, once you have your trap active, it's important to remember that even though wild pigs are an invasive species, they're a pest, they're damaging your landscape, they are still a vertebrate animal. They register pain and stress. So you need to be using humane trapping and removal efforts. So once those traps are active, you need to check them once a day. Um, and ideally those traps are in somewhere that has a little bit of shade for these animals. Because remember, they can't thermoregulate, so they're going to be in heat stress if they can't cool down. And when it comes to euthanizing these animals, you need to do that quickly and efficiently uh, for the animal's sake. And so uh, there's a diagram here that shows sort of the, the angle and approach that you want to shoot when you're killing these animals in these traps. So, with that, I just want to point you to some additional uh, web-based resources that are really good for wild pig info. So Mississippi State University's Extension website has a really get great uh, website for wild pig. Uh, Texas A&M Extension has a great wild pig website and the USDA as well. And within our uh, uh, lab, we've got several upcoming uh, wild pig resources and to, in addition to the ones that we already have available. So we've got a wild pigs regulations and rules in Florida. There's a lot of rules around wild pigs in Florida. We've got a document that sort of explains those and breaks those all down. Uh, that's in the works. And then we also have an update to our wild pigs in Florida ecology and management document that's hopefully coming out later this year as well. And then uh, I'm excited about a new project that we've got going on. We've got a new graduate student that joined the lab in January, and they'll be looking at the barriers that rural residents and livestock producers face in implementing effective wild pig management using a survey. So uh, if you're out there in Florida, you might receive one of these surveys. Please respond to it. Uh, it's helping us learn about the barriers, the damage, and what you are doing uh, for wild pigs on your landscape and how we can help you do it more effectively. And, and then finally, just be on the lookout for future wild pig management extension programming and research that's gonna come from our lab, hopefully later this year.
And with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, acknowledge that this work has been funded by the USDA NIFA Hatch uh, grant and uh, our project for that. And uh, if there's time, I can take any questions. Uh, so the question is, uh, if we capture the most of the sounder, but some of the piglets don't get captured, what's the probability of their survival without adults? And, and, and it depends on their age, obviously. An animal that's not yet weaned is, is not going to last. These younger piglets, uh, they are more susceptible to predation. And so, uh, they, yeah, either they're potentially going to starve or they're going to be predated. However, you still should be trying to capture that whole group uh, when you do removal efforts. Yeah, so the question was about uh, adult pigs uh, interacting negatively. Um, and, and so males, uh, they are territorial. Uh, they will defend access to the sounders. Those are their breeding opportunities. Um, so they will uh, have antagonistic interactions. Now, I don't know if there's any sort of papers that have looked at what's a mortality rate due to those interactions, um, but most animals, uh, even if they're fighting over access to females and resources like that, uh, they they mostly try to bluff and, and convince the other animal to leave. It's n in no male's interest to have a mortal wound over a female, uh, at least in large mammals that live for many years. Uh, I have one question online. Uh, do you think wild pigs positively affect soil nutrient availability? Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm not a, a soil scientist. So I actually don't know a whole lot about uh, soil chemistry and how they might impact it. I mean, in given areas and in some of these uh, areas, the reason why some of those chemicals and some of those uh, compounds are increasing in those watersheds is because pigs spend a lot of time in that water and they defecate a lot in that water and they're big animals. So would that have a positive impact? I mean, I, I think it depends on how you define positive and what your goals are. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer for that. <laughs> So, like, have it, are you saying having a market for wild pigs? Right, yeah, so there is, there, and that, that'll be covered hopefully in our extension document about the different rules and regulations related to, to wild pigs in Florida. Um, under certain situ situations and with certain licenses, uh, a wild pig that was harvested can be, uh, you know, basically certified for human consumption, even commercially, but it, it's really restricted in Florida and, and it's sort of a difficult process. Now, outside of that, if you hunt a wild pig and you want to consume it, uh, that that's a lot easier for you to do. But there is things that you should potentially be worried about. Um, but mass vaccination programs, given the number of wild pigs uh, on the landscape, that would be pretty difficult uh, to do. Um, and, and things we didn't talk about in terms of effective control of wild pigs that are potentially in the pipeline is there are uh, toxicants that are currently being studied in terms of their effectiveness. They're really effective at wild pigs, but they're not all that selective, so they hit a lot of other species as well. But those might be in the pipeline five to 10 years from now uh, for other control options. Okay, so the first thing that I would like to invite you all to come back for is our next ONA highlight. That's going to be June 14th, and that is going to be a graduate student highlight with Vinicius. He is a PhD student in the program of animal science under the advisement of Dr. Philippe Moriel, and he's going to be speaking on heat stress in pregnant beef cows. And so, as, as normal, Whenever I send out the recording for this webinar with a copy or a link rather to the PDF handout of these slides for Dr. Ellington, I will include the link to register for this upcoming webinar as well as the information flyers and or links for the events that I'm going to share as well.
So coming up this month, we're gonna have the fifth annual Nutrition for Beef Females program. And that's actually gonna be in three locations. We were only advertising the two on the flyer um, because the other location didn't believe they would have enough space, but they worked things out and they are gonna have extra space. So I'd also like to tell you about one that's gonna be May 19th, and that's gonna be at the Florida A&M University Brooksville Agricultural Research Station. And that is the 19th, and I believe it is also an evening program. And for all of these, there is no cost to attend. And like I said, I'm pretty sure they all begin at six. The other one is gonna be May 25th in Okeechobee, the next one May 26th in Arcadia. So good program coming up soon. Also coming up soon is our Youth Field Day. This is an annual program. It's a full day program for students ages eight to 18. Um, also welcome our parents and youth leaders. And I will send you all the details for this in the email. And new that I didn't mention last month, this year we're also having a t-shirt contest. And anybody can get in the t-shirt contest. Um, a design, we were wanting to look for something new and fresh. There's this flyer and then there's also an entry and release form that I will share with you in my email. And that will have all the details. Entries need to be received by June 1st. And there are prizes, so I can't wait to see your design. So far, we've had one entry. If you're not already doing so, please follow us on our website, social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you're not already on our mailing list, please let me know to add you whenever I send you this information. And you will get weekly newsy emails from us with what's happening, upcoming events, new recordings, new publications, things like that that would interest you. So again, thank you so much for attending today's ONA Highlight, and we look forward to seeing you in June.